Hey crew, it's Pitt, and I'm back with a Bible study. Uh, I had been planning on doing a Wednesday Bible study. It's been something that I've been planning on doing. But this week's been weird. If you're here, then you probably know that I put out a video about what happened to me as a child. While I was debating on whether or not to make that video public, a verse came to me. My grandmother took me in when I was a teenager. And she was the most godly woman that I have ever known. She lived out what she believed. And most of my strength and my faith comes from my grandmother. And I heard her voice tell me that you do not know, but that you may have been placed here for this. Now, I know that's not a direct quote. And I could not place that quote. But I went to bed with that on my mind. I woke up the next morning and it was still on my mind. So I went ahead and I posted the video. Uh, I made it public. I had planned on doing it on my other channel so that it wasn't on this channel and it wasn't seen as a clickbait thing or whatever. And then I came out here. This is my little office. It's in my garage. It's a little spare room that we built. And it's in my room. I'm in my office and I'm preparing because I have already felt like maybe Job was where I needed to to do my Bible study. So I open my Bible right here to the book of Job. And I was reading through Job. And I do this on the computer because it's easier for you to follow along and to see what I'm referencing. But I, I read my Bible. I have several versions of different translations and I, I read my Bible. And as I'm reading through, I don't spend a lot of time in the in the Old Testament. I don't. I spend well. I don't spend a lot of time outside of prophecy in the Old Testament, and that's something that I need to work on. But I did not recognize where this quote came from, and I went to the Book of Job, and I started reading through Job, and something just wouldn't let me settle in on the message of Job that needs to come, and will come. It took me back a chapter. Now. My grandmother's name was Esther. The book of Esther precedes Job, if you're unaware. Uh, it, it's a great story. It is a hopeful story. And it's a story that has a lot of meaning for us right now. It has a lot of meaning with what my video was about. And my grandmother's name was Esther, and she told me, well, when I got to chapter 4, I saw the verse. <clears throat> so I know where my Bible study needs to be. And we're going to jump in in the book of Esther. I will not do a full reading of the book of Esther, but we will be covering pretty much the entire book of Esther. Uh, I'm using Bible Hub because it's easy to click on one of these little things and you can open up a new page or however you want to do it. And then you can take any one of these words and you can look at what the word means. With all of that being said, we're going to dive in now. And we're going to talk about the book of Esther and what it means for us today. Um, in the time of Xerxes, who was one of the rulers of Assyria, um, he had reigned over 127 provinces from India to Kush. India to Kush is from India all the way to Africa. Kush is in Africa. It is one of the, it's just below Egypt. Um, and it, that's, a, that's a broad area. It's similar to the Roman Empire. It's similar to several other, several other empires, I'm sorry. Um, and so that's the scope that we're looking at. They have taken over everything. And King Xerxes rules absolutely in his kingdoms. He has several sub princes or sub kings or however you want to call them uh, that he calls officials and servants and military leaders or whatever and he's hosting a feast for them and nothing is spared no expense is spared in this feast which could quite possibly be drawn to a very recent birthday party that we won't get into where several hundred people got together and um Nothing was held back. There was no limit placed 
on the drinking, and every official in the household was to serve whatever the man desired. Well, in this drunken revel, Xerxes got a bright idea to call his queen from her separate feast so that she could be shown off to the men. And she refused. Oh, apparently, we don't know for sure, but apparently that was kind of her prerogative at the time. Oh, there was seems to be some equity there, and this might be where some of the equity was lost in history. Oh, it seems to be that way if you read through this book. Well, the king was very upset about this. He, he, he was very upset. She challenged his authority. She did it publicly in front of all of these people who they list off here. And so he consults the wise men at the time. And they knew the times, which is an interesting turn of phrase. It's, it, it can mean that they knew what was going on now. But it also has an, uh, one of the definitions is they foresaw. And they saw what was coming and what could be. Now, that could be logically applied. And they were using logic to determine what could be. Or it could be prophetically implied. And they were using divine sources to see what was actually going to happen. And it was customary for him to talk to these people to get their idea of what should happen because he he was trying to do the best he could even though he was somewhat of a tyrant. And he was very mad and they told him that he should put his queen aside. They told him that he should make a proclamation for the entire kingdom all the way from India to Kush that any woman that disobeyed her husband was to be punished and set away and that way women would learn their lesson and that's what it says right here this apparently began here uh, because it, it's implied in the text that it was not that way prior uh, everybody was happy about this well men were anyway and so the the king did what the what was recommended and he sent these letters out well later uh, king Xerxes got horny and he decided he wanted to get some more women around so he gathered make let a search be made for beautiful virgins and bring them before the king they gathered all the pretty women in the kingdom and they brought them in the they put them as, as concubines in this harem and they trained them they gave them treatments and baths and taught them how to act and how to be and one in particular by the name of Esther uh, Hadassah, that is to say Esther, they, they, they changed a lot of names, and we're not going to get into that. Give me one sec. Uh, was one of these people. She was the niece, or the cousin, the cousin of Mordecai. Mordecai adopted her when his uncle and his wife, or his uncle's wife, passed away. He took in the child, Hadassah, and he raised her in the ways of God, in the, in the ways of the Jews. Well, he also told her to hide that she was a Jew whenever she went into the concubine. Um, even then, Jews were not highly regarded in most of the Middle East. There's the whole, you know, there's there's long history. We'll get into that eventually. Um, so, for a year, they're prepared, and in her year um, she learned many things and that's what this is dealing with and we're not going to read all of the things but um, she was brought to King Xerxes in the royal palace in the 10th month uh, the month of Tibet now I brought up this right here so that you can see uh, you're going to have a hard time seeing but this is Tibet I'm not going to try and rearrange it right now it's kind of a pain to go back and forth but this is Tibet and Tibet translates to December or January. That's I'm bringing that in so that we can look at this again in just a little bit. But uh, this is when she was brought before him. And the king loved her more than all other women. And she found grace and favor in his sight more than all the other virgins. So he placed a royal crown on her head and made her the queen in place of Vashti. Uh, then he held a great banquet 
for all of his servants and proclaimed a tax holiday in the provinces and gave gifts and all of these things that they do. Well, while this is going on, Mordecai, her cousin who took her in, discovers a conspiracy to kill the, the king, to, to slay Xerxes, by two of his eunuchs, who are men who have been demanded, and uh, they were angry and they wanted to assassinate him. Well, Mordecai heard it, and he told Esther, and then Esther told the king Xerxes. And Xerxes was happy about this. It was recorded in Chronicles. You can go back. It is in the book of Chronicles. Oh, and I'm not sure if it's first or second. Might look that up and might not. Uh, at this time, there was also a man named Haman, son of Hamadatha, the Agagite. Now, this is, this is where it really gets interesting for me. Because, because of this, we're going to go ahead and we'll, we'll swap over and we'll see uh, Agag. This is the root from which Agagite comes from. And it is pronounced Agog. You can see it here just barely, but it is pronounced Agog. There's a prophecy coming about a fight. And there will be Gog and Magog. And there is some debate over what the lands are and all of this. But this, this struck me. This seems to be why God led me to this. And we're going to look real quick. I pulled up the map, and it is right here, of Assyria. It's, I'm not going to be able to. Maybe I can do this and pull it closer. And, well, that's not much better. But what we've got here is a very interesting thing. Here is Syria, Turkey, Iran, Iraq. Assyria is the land where Haman is from. This is Agog. This is Agog. Well, this particular area right here is the center of some strife right now. Some very recent events have mimicked some events from almost a decade ago now. Well, six or seven years at least with ISIS and the caliphate. If you are unaware, there has to be a caliphate at the end. There will be people that arise and they will come and there will be war and it's going to head off in this direction because right over here is Israel. This, this is a very interesting section of land right here. ISIS took over most of this area right here. This, what you can see on this map, a large portion of it was taken over by ISIS and I feel that it will be again the uh, the Taliban is over there right now or is it Al Qaeda it might be Al Qaeda uh, regardless they're over there forming the caliphate right now it's coming back to this All right so Hamam son of Hamadetha the Agagite was elevated to a place above all the princes that were with him so he was the he in this land of Agog was elevated. And he was not happy because at the king's gate was Mordecai. And Mordecai would not do what was he was told to do. They were told, the king had commanded that all the royal servants would bow down and pay homage to Haman. Well Mordecai said he will not bow down to any man. There is a lot in this that is very recent. There is a reason that God put this on me, and there's a reason I am talking to you about this. Mordecai stood on his belief and said, I will not bow before you. I will not. And so he was, he was hated. Xerxes wanted to know. The, the royal service asked why he wouldn't do it, and he told him, it's because of my beliefs, because I'm a Jew. I'm not going to do this because I believe in God. I am not going to do this. And that might sound similar to some of you right now. Haman saw that Mordecai would not bow and he was filled with rage. That seems similar to some things going on right now too. Uh, there are decisions that people are making that are filling people with rage. And what they are doing, or what Xerxes did, was... He decided he was going to destroy, not Mordecai, but all of Mordecai's people, the Jews, 
throughout the kingdom of Xerxes, which stretches from where? From India to Kush, all the way from the Far East to Africa. And they they cast lots in uh was it it was in Tishri, I think. On when to do it. Oh in in the twelfth year in the first month of Nisan, the pure, that is the lot, was cast before Haman to determine the day and the month of when this would happen. And it would fall on the twelfth month of the month of Adar. Alright, well we're gonna pull back up this and we're gonna look here is Adar, month twelve. It is February of and March is the decided time for the destruction of the Jews by Haman. There's, a, there's something there, and I'm not going to say it. I'm not sure, therefore I will not say it. But there is something there that's got me a little concerned. So Haman went to Xerxes and he said, there's people who will not do what you're telling them to do. Their laws are different, and they do not obey your laws. So... What do you say we put out a bounty and we kill them all? I will put in 10,000 talents of silver and to pay the people who are going to kill all the Jews. That's what this says. And so the king took off his, his ring and gave it to Oman and told him to sue the thing, do your thing. He said, keep your money. These people are given to you to do as you please. He's like, no, nah, don't pay me. You can go ahead and kill them. And so on the 13th day of the first month, which would be here. So he's got exactly a year to organize this to when it's going to happen. This is March and April when the decree is organized. And it's going to ha happen in February or March. He says, keep your money. And then on the 13th day, the royal scribes sent out the order. And they were given to couriers, and they were sent to each of the providences in order to kill. It took a long time for messages to get out there. That's why the delay. That's why he couldn't say, do this now and kill them now. Yeah. There's another message there. Communication is much more efficient these days. And so the copy of the text was sent out and uh, spurred on by the command. The edict was issued in the citadel. And the king and Amon sat down to drink, but the city was in confusion. When Mordecai learned of all that would have that had happened, and he went into what he was told to do in the Bible. The Bible says that when you have a concern, that you should put on sackcloth and ashes, and humble thyself, and just go out and pray. And he went out into the middle of the city, wailing loudly and bitterly to call attention and let people know. Listen to me, please. Everybody, listen what is about to happen. And then Esther's handmaidens and eunuchs told her about her cousin, who was her adopted father. And she was overcome with distress, and she sent for Mordecai. And she said, close to him, and he would not accept him. And then she summoned him to her through Hatak, one of the, the, the eunuchs. And uh, Hatak went out to find out what was going on. And he told him, and he came back. And uh, so Mordecai gave a copy of the letter <laughs> to give to Esther to show that, yes, this is what is happening. This is what Xerxes has, has approved through Haman. So Esther spoke to him and instructed him to tell Mordecai that all the officials and the people know that one law applies to every man or woman who approaches the king without being summoned to be put to death. She said, if I go before God, before Xerxes with this, if I speak out, then he will kill me uh, more than likely. If I go before him and he doesn't spare me, then I die. And this is where God really spoke to me because I'm reading through this and then I got here. When Esther's words were relayed to Mordecai, he sent back to her this reply. Let me see. Make sure y'all can see this. And Do not imagine that because you are in the king's palace, you alone will escape the, the fate. Don't think you will be accepted from what is coming. For if you remain silent at this time, 
relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place. But you and your father's house will perish. And who knows if perhaps you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Now, I've gone into my story. I have been Jonah for 20 years now. I have been running. I have been in the belly. And I finally decided to quit running. And I come out with my beliefs, despite the fact that many people are going to be upset when, whenever these videos do get out, and they will get out. People are going to be upset by this. It will happen. God has shown me that that will happen, and that's why I ran. But this line right here was given to me the night I recorded the, the video that I put up. I guess it's got to be me, or it's got to be me, I guess, is what I titled it. Uh, this, voice, this came to me in my grandmother Esther's voice, and I did not remember that this was from the book of Esther. My grandmother's been dead for over a decade now, and I, we still talk. <laughs> um, so Esther sent this reply to Mordecai, and this is the part that I'm taking to heart. It said, Go forth and assemble all the Jews who can be found, and do a fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days, night or day, and my maidens will fast as you do. And after that, I will go to the king, even though it is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. I don't normally announce this, but I am starting a fast today. I don't know that I have what it takes to not do dream. My voice, and this, until God takes this from me, this is the thing that I have to deal with. I've, I'm not having surgery for it. God has put it there. So that it may be relieved to bring glory to him. That is what it's there for. I'm confident in that and my wife's not. But such is life. But I'm going to start this fast. I don't, I'm not going to ask you to, to fast with me. But I am going to fast. This is the only time I'm going to talk about it. I don't believe in, I'm fasting today, I'm fasting today, I'm fasting today. I, that, that, that sits wrong in my soul. But this in particular, I feel I need to be speaking on because part of this fasting is prayer. And when you when you feel the hunger and you feel the need, then you are to turn in prayer at that time. That is why we fast, is to turn the attention to God. That is what the whole point of fasting is. It's not to lose weight or to increase your metabolism or anything like that. And it is not... So people can look at you and be like, oh, look at him. He's fasting. He's so holy. That is not what it is for. It is to remind you every time that the hunger takes you that you are to turn to God with what you are praying over. And I am praying for several things, but I am praying for relief from the spirit of cowardice that is currently upon us and that is leading us to destruction. I'm praying for discernment that I continue to preach the message that God wants me to speak. I really would rather not be the one in charge, but I have as I have said that if God has chosen me, then I will take the mantle. I have the strength. I know I do. It matters not what people say. It matters not to me what comes upon me. I can deal with physical affliction, I promise you. I have walked that walk. I have fought that fight my entire life. And that I can do. And I am praying for another discernment. I am praying for the discernment to know how to reach those who need to be reached. Because we are in a critical time. The reason that I am doing this on a Wednesday, as well as the one that I am going to do on Sunday, is because I feel the pressure upon us. This makes me feel some pressure after reading through what I've read. Esther approaches the king. Now we're getting into the second half of this book, and it's, it's interesting to show God's faithfulness. And there's a reason why this was given to me too. And so Esther goes, and on the third day after the, after the prayer and after the feasting, or the fasting, not the feasting, 
She puts on her royal attire and she goes. She does what she said she would do. She clothes herself as she needs to be. And she goes and she stands to the side in view of the king, despite the fact that if he does not recognize her, then she's going to die. But he does. Of course he does. God's will is being worked. And he goes and he says, What is it? What is your request? Even up to half of the kingdom, I will give it to you. And she says, If it pleases the king, may you and Haman come to the banquet I have prepared. All right, well, that's easy. I just offered her half of the kingdom. And she says, no, come and eat with me. You and Haman. Okay. So he summons Haman, and they go. And they drink their wine, and the king says to Esther, what's your petition? And it will be given. What is your request? Up to half of my kingdom. And he says, this is, she says, this is my petition. If I have found favor in your sight, and it pleases the king, Fulfill my request, and may y'all come tomorrow and eat with me again. And then I will answer your question. Well, that day, Haman went out with a full, a heart full of joy and glad. And he said, he, and at the king's gate, he saw Mordecai, who did not rise and did not tremble in fear. And he was mad again, bruh. How dare this man? How dare he? But he restrained himself, and he went home. And he called for his friends and his wife, and he recounted to them his wealth and his sons and all the ways that God had honored him. And remember, we're going to Job next. What is more, Esther invited no one but me and the king to come. And he so he honors her in this. And says, none, none of this satisfies me as long as I see that bastard sitting there. And that's my word, not his. And I... I, I'll take responsibility for that. <laughs> and his wife and his friend says, well, here's what you do. is You build a gallows and then you get the, you get Xerxes to hang him. You're still going to kill the Jews, but then you get to take care of Mordecai now. <laughs> and so that night, <laughs> sleep escaped the king. And so he ordered the book of records, Chronicles, to be brought and read to him. And there... It was brought to his attention about Mordecai and the assassination plot. And he's like, wow, I forgot about that. I need to take care of that. So the next day, Haman comes, and, and he's in the outer court. And uh, the king asks who's out there, and he says, it's Haman. He said, well, bring him here. And so he comes in, and he asks Haman, he says, so what should I do for the man whom the king is delighted to honor? And Haman thought that he was talking about Haman. And he says, well, here's what you do. You robe him as if he was you. And you honor him as if he was you. And you give him the horse that you have ridden. And you do all these things to make it seem as if he is you. Because he thought that he was talking about him. But he wasn't. He said, all right, you, the Hamam, he says, you go and do this. Take this robe and this horse to Mordecai. <laughs> And do not neglect anything that you have neglected. Now you know Haman was mad about this. And so he goes. And uh, he goes and he does it. And he's mad. And he goes to his wife and his friends. And he tells them everything that happened. After he rushes home and covers his head in grief. Like he's ashamed. So he's like. Ah! And he runs off. And he covers his head in grief. And he tells his wife and his friends what happened. And they tell him. Well since Mordecai. Uh, before whom your downfall has begun is Jewish, you will not prevail against him, for surely you will fail, will fall before him. And they were while they were speaking, the king's eunuchs arrived and rushed him to the banquet. So he's in the he's in the banquet with Esther, and I've got to get a drink. I'm sorry. And he goes in with the and they drink and they get drunk and the king says one more time. He says, "What is your petition, Esther?" Give it, and I will give it to you, even up to half the kingdom. He says, well, I found favor in your sight, and if it pleases the king, grant me my life and my people's life as the request. For my people and I have been sold out to destruction, death, and annihilation. And this is my fourth prayer in feasting. If we had merely been sold as servants, I would have remained silent, 
because no distress would dis would justify burning the king. If it is just physical that you bring to me, then whatever. But it is not. It is the eradication of my people. And so I come before you, O king. That is what she said. And Xerxes is like, wait, what? Who did this? Tell me. Then the, who, who would do this? And he says, the adversary and the enemy is this wicked man, Haman. And Haman is like, what? And in his fury, the king arose and went into the garden. And the man stayed to beg Esther for his life. For he realized the king was planning a terrible fate for him. The king is planning a terrible fate for those who stand against the faith. That is truth. That is coming too. We will get into Revelation soon. And as soon as the words had left the king's... Or wait. The king returned from the garden... And Haman was falling on the couch where Esther was reclining. And the king's like, what are you doing in the bed with my wife? Are you going to assault her while I'm in here? And then as soon as he left, the words left the king's mouth, they covered Haman's face. So they took him. They're like, all right, bro. And then Harbona, one of the eunuchs, said the gears of Galilee is out front. At Haman's house, he had it built for Mordecai, who gave the report that saved the king. <laughs> and the king's like, hang him on it. So they hung him on the gallows he had prepared for Mordecai. And then the fury of the king subsided. Now, we are not going to be delivered out of this. But we just can see what's coming, and there is judgment coming. So Esther appeals for the Jews and she says to the king, she says, please take this away from my people. If it pleases the king and I have found favor, then let this order go out to revoke the order. And so King Xerxes says to Esther and to Mordecai, behold, I have given Haman's state to Esther and he was hanged on the gallows because he attacked the Jews. Now, you may write in the king's name as you please regarding the Jews and seal it. So they send out the order to rescind the order. The, the death of the Jews were, was delayed. And these letters are permitted to the Jews in every city the right to assemble and defend themselves, to destroy, kill, and annihilate the, the forces of any people or provinces hostile to them, including women and children and to plunder their possessions. The single day provided throughout all the provinces was the 13th day of the 12th month, the month of Adar. So the justification comes back and the day that the destruction was planned for, the destruction was changed out. And instead of killing the Jews, the Jews went forth with vengeance. There's a lesson there. Uh, and for the Jews, it was a time of light and gladness and joy and honor. In every province, in every city, there was joy and gladness and feasting and celebrating. And the people of the land themselves became Jews because the fear of the Jews was upon them. And on the 13th day of the 12th month, the king's command and edicts were to be executed. And the Jews went forth and they did. They, they exacted their vengeance. Now, there is a lesson in vengeance being exacted. I do not pray for vengeance. I pray for freedom. The rest of this is the, the judgment that was brought upon Haman and his house. It was eradicated. These were the people that were judging because they would not falter in their views on God. They would not bow to the will of man. They stood by God. And the judgment was cast upon them. And instead vengeance was played. Oh. And the feast of Purim was instituted. The Jews assembled on the 13th and 14th day. There was variation in the time depending on where they were. On when the, the order was executed. 
But the custom was called Purim, the, the celebration therefore and the, from their own out. Because of the instructions and because of all they had seen, the Jews bound themselves to establish the custom that they and their descendants who will, and all who join them shall not fail to celebrate these days. The days are the 12th month and occur between February and March. Uh, Esther 10 is now Xerxes is imposed tribute throughout the land and all of Mordecai's powerful and magnificent accomplishments are recorded in the book of Chronicles and the book of Esther. <laughs> uh, there's a lesson here. Things will not happen as they have before, but they will repeat with striking similarity. It is given unto them to persecute and to, to prevail. It is given unto us to feast, or I did it again, to fast and to pray for discernment. What we are told to do is to stand firm, to live for God unequivocally, and to die when that time comes. There are a lot of people that are thinking that we're going to get a get out of tribulation free card. And that, that might happen. I might be wrong. I feel that God has told me that that will not happen, that we will have to die or we will have to run. I will get into the reasoning behind that. We've touched on it briefly and we will touch on it greatly. But this, this was put on me. This, this I had to speak on. And this I had to say something about. I've, I've said just about all I need to say on this, but there's a lesson in, in Agog. There is. There is a lesson in what is going on right now in Afghanistan. There is. It is not the first time this has happened. I thought maybe the last time that this happened was when we started to pull out and we left a lot of equipment and there was a rise of a caliphate. I was like, well, maybe this is it. But it was not, and I'm glad that I didn't come forward in the saying that this was it. Maybe this is it. Maybe I'm wrong. I'm willing to admit I could be wrong. Always. But I don't know. I'm really feeling this one. I've got a feeling like we don't know the dime or the hour. We don't. But we've been given seasons to watch for. We've been given signs to watch for. And when the fig tree comes out, and I don't know if you can see this or not, but the month of Shabbat is the winter fix. And pray not that your flight be in winter. And then we get into the spring right after. And that's right around the time of Adar when we go into the spring. That is on the back side of the persecution. And the persecution is the winter. And that, that, that is what I feel. That is how I feel led. Uh, most of the spring feasts have been fulfilled. There are great, wonderful arguments that can be made for Jesus' life, birth, death, resurrection, fulfilling feasts, all the way up to and including the Passover. The fall feasts, trumpets, and the harvest, the harvest have not yet been fulfilled. The harvest of the saints, I feel, is the harvest of the martyrs and where we will stand before the great throne in robes of white until the full measure is reached. There is great tribulation coming. There are seals, there are bowls, and there are trumpets. I got that wrong in my last one I said thunders. It is not seals, bowls, and trumpets. The seals are minor, but they are warnings. I feel like the seals are being opened as we speak. There is people that would have argued for a 70 year seal period. I don't know about all that. But there are seals. <laughs> right now we are in war. And we are in pestilence. And there is a great famine coming. 
know that. Prepare for that. We've had seven years of preparation. We're about to have a seven years of trial. Know that. Prepare for that. Know that you have to stand firm. You have to die. Or run. He does say run. When you see the abomination that causes desolation, take off. Don't stop. Don't grab nothing. Bail out. And trust to God for your provisioning. I have laid up supplies. <laughs> when I leave, I'm not taking them. Like, if it's a best biblical thing, like, I, I'm not going to take time to go back and grab. That's what he says. Don't, don't go into the house to grab. Go. It would be foolish that if I'm sitting next to some of my supplies and I don't grab them, that is foolishness. And God does not reward foolishness in any way. God does prepare. God does reward steadfastness. God does reward you doing what you were told to do. Me, right here, right now, is doing what God has told me to do. That video I released a couple days ago was God telling me to do something and me doing it. Starting this channel and every single one of the videos that I have covered, including the typology that I have done, has all led to me having a greater understanding of what is coming and what is what going forth. If you watch this and you go back and you see my first video dealing with all of this and go forward, you can see you can see God working. You can. The videos that have come to me is absolutely God working. The message that has come out of me is absolutely God working. And what I am telling you right now with all of my heart and all of my earnestness is to prepare to stand firm. I am not talking about this. I am not even talking about this. Those two things I personally will not do. That is my decision. We have talked extensively in this house and I feel confident that that is my family's decision but they have their choices to make. <clears throat> I will not judge them, I will not judge you. These things are not the mark of the beast. But this system coming is. This tracking, this shall shall not buy or sell is coming. What else is coming is the persecution of the saints. We have not had that yet. There will be a great persecution. There will be a great trial. There will be a great deception. And there will be a great falling away. There are a lot of people out here that are expecting a get out of tribulation free card. And when that does not happen, they will say, then we must have been wrong. And we will go ahead and do this. And then once you've done this, this next step is going to be real easy for you. Because you've already accepted the change. I personally think that this is going to change the helix in a manner that is going to make you not human. Sorry if that offends someone. Uh, it's not the goal of this, but it is what's happening. The spike protein, I said it that way for a reason, and it's not hidden meaning, it is just so the algorithm might not pick it up, changes you on a fundamental level. It changes your body on a fundamental level. It does. It changes how your body makes things. No human has, has any idea what they are doing with DNA. They think they do. They are absolutely convinced that their Tower of Babel is the right way. It is not. There is a very good argument to be made that the Tower of Babel was actually... I'm making sure this isn't messing up. I thought it might have been. Oh, 
that the Tower of Babel might have actually been people messing with DNA. There is significant evidence in some of the extra biblical books of DNA tampering, of half-human, half-animal hybrids. And that the reason we were scattered upon the earth was so that we could not cooperate in that manner. I think, personally, that what is coming at the end of Revelation is not a gathering in heaven. It is a new earth. What he says in that book is that the life on earth will be changed forever. That the millennial reign is going to be a thousand years of people leaving, living pretty much like we lived 6,000 years ago. That what's coming is going to completely eradicate many things. And uh, I think these elites know that. I think that they're playing into that and they think they're going to come out on the top of that. That won't happen. What will happen is that we will go back to where we were. We will go back to the time just after the flood when humanity had to reorganize. We will go back to the time just after Adam when humanity had to reorganize. We will go back to the time prior to that where humanity had to reorganize. There had been a cycle there has been a cycle. It is trackable. Gil Broussard does some amazing work with that. Check him out. I'm going to go ahead and start wrapping this up because we will be coming back to this kind of thing. We will be in Job next. Be ready. Job has a lot of stuff that people are looking at the wrong way. And so we're going to dive into Job. That might be two hours. This one's going to be close to an hour. We're at 46 minutes. So I'm not cutting things. This is a one-shot, one-take type of situation. I put out what God tells me to put out. I pray before this that he does not let me say what I don't need to say. And he's good about shutting me up. Now we're going to go ahead and wrap that up here. If you're sticking around, you are a trooper. And uh, by that I mean a soldier of God. He's got a reason that you're listening. You might be mad at me for what I say. But know that God is in it. And I'm okay with you being mad. I can take the smoke. I'm built that way. Said so a crew, thank you for hanging out. I appreciate every single minute that you were with me. And this was a long one. When I do these long things, it messes up the algorithm. You know, I know that some of y'all know that, but most of you don't. I'm not here for the algorithm. I do want the channel to grow. I do want to ride the algorithm. But I am not here to please man, and I'm not really even here to make money. Although that is coming. I'm working on merch. Because that's coming too. We're going to bring some glory out. And we're going to just make some humor out. And we're going to do things. So merch is coming. I'm not going to get into that until it gets requested repeatedly by many people. And I'm only going to mention it here. Because if you're alone this long. You're probably going to be one of the ones mentioning it. And I love you. <laughs> oh, This has been Pitt's Take. I'm praying for you daily. Peace.